Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with Knowledge of Wharton today. Glad to be here. You've interviewed more than 200 CEOs for your New York Times corner office column, and you drew on 70 interviews with CEOs and top executives for your book, The Corner Office, Indispensable and Unexpected Lessons from CEOs on How to Lead and Succeed. Through these conversations, you've distilled five qualities of successful leaders. Tell us about those. Sure, and what I really tried to do is understand what is it about these people that explains why they kept getting promoted to the corner office. It's not so much what's your secret to success, but really trying to understand why they kept getting promoted. The five qualities, I'll run through them very quickly. The first one is passionate curiosity. That really refers to a deep sense of engagement with the world, just a questioning mind. They're interested about people, interested about things. When they go into a situation, they try and figure out, how does this work, and how can it be made to work better? The second one is battle-hardened confidence, which really refers to having a track record of facing down adversity and knowing what you're capable of, because at all points in our life, we get put kind of on the hot seat in stressful situations. And I really felt like these CEOs had faced down that adversity and were there was that kind of quiet confidence they knew what they were capable of. Um, the third one is team smarts, which is sort of the organizational equivalent of street smarts. Um, basically, you know kind of where the soft levers of power are in an organization. You have good antenna for meeting dynamics um, and really just a good sense of how to bring people together. Uh, the fourth one is what I call a simple mindset, and that really refers to the ability to distill, distill a lot of information down into the one or two or three things that matter. When you stand up in front of a group of employees, you don't want to say to them, these are the, these are the 12 things I want you to think about this year. You really want to give them one, two, or three, because that's what people can remember. And I do believe on those days, CEOs really earn their paycheck if they can take a very complicated portfolio company and say, these are the three things that matter. Uh, and the last one is fearlessness, which is really just um, kind of a bias towards action, um, not recklessness but really willing to take risks, willing to see things um, that might be need, need to be turned upside down or inside out to be improved. The CEOs that I've interviewed, they have this kind of reverence in their voice when they talk about this quality of fearlessness. So those are the five. And can you tell us, um, give us some examples of, uh, you know, a couple of the leaders you talked to and some things um, that they said to you that really resonated? Out of all of them, um, you know, Alan Mulally of Ford uh, really talked about how this quality of passionate curiosity, just whatever whatever situation he's in, if he's in a group of people, he wants to ask them um, all sorts of questions and kind of understand people. Uh, one woman I interviewed had a great expression. People always talk about left-brained and right-brained. She talked she talked about the fact that she felt that she had a middle brain, um, which is a good balance of the analytical and the creative. And um, that was kind of a, a nifty way of capturing an idea that uh, came across in a lot of the interviews where um, it really is a matter of marrying the two sides of the brain. You do have to have the creative, I think, to be successful, but you also need to balance it with the analytical. So um, I like this expression, middle brain. Mm -hmm. And would you say, in your view, do these five traits help CEOs guard against uh, corruption, bankruptcies, and, and scandals? Uh, wow, uh, that's a good <laughs> question. Um, it's it, it's hard to know. I mean, these are certainly these personal quali qualities. If they are truly passionately curious, then hopefully they'll have that sense about their organizations and they're not just sitting in their ivory tower. Um, you know, the whole moral compass, ethics, uh, that's almost like a whole separate discussion. I mean, we keep getting um, examples in the newspapers. You know, almost every month there's some new scandal. Uh, and I find it remarkable. I mean, to be candid with you, some of the CEOs I've interviewed, yeah. over time, I've seen headlines in the stories, um, you know, where they're in kind of controversial situations. And I guess it goes back to my evolving theory of life, which is that if you give enough people enough time, some people are gonna do questionable things. You note that management is about results. What insights do the CEOs you spoke with um, have on managing people in order to get those results? Uh, I think a lot of a lot of it is really about marshalling the team and really giving people a sense of 
clear mission. Uh, because if you can really boil down the goals of an organization to, you know, just the three metrics, um, maybe the one overarching goal for the company, then people have a clear sense of what their role is in the organization and how that contributes to those goals. And I think in a lot of organizations, especially big ones, people feel like they're off in silos and they don't really understand how their work is contributing to that goal. That's why I think it's so important, this notion of simplicity. If you can really boil down the strategy or the, just to have a simple plan and say, here's how we're gonna measure it, and then people can, throughout their day, at least have an awareness of how their work can contribute to those goals. Because I do think a lot of people are team players at, at their heart, but they need to know how they can contribute. Otherwise, they're gonna be on Facebook and Twitter all day. One sort of important question, um, based on your interviews, do you think leaders are born or made? I think it's a little bit of both. I really do. I think there has to be a, a little bit of aptitude to begin with, maybe a lot of aptitude. Uh, but I do feel like a lot of these skills can be developed. In fact, I've met some executives over the years, um, not even just CEOs, who are very mindful about it. I, I like to think of these five traits. Um, it's a little bit like dieting. If, if you agree that these five traits I've identified, and I'm not saying I've cracked some magic code, people might come up with their own categories if they were to study the same transcripts of the interviews I did. Um, but if you agree with them broadly, then it really comes down to throughout your day, you're always making small and large choices in the same way you make choices about diet and exercise. And if you keep these in mind, and if you're in a situation where um, it is kind of a team dynamic, then just watching people who are particularly good at it and studying it, looking for the impact, um, being fearless, not just at work, but in your own personal life, taking chances, taking risks. Uh, if you want to emulate the CEOs and you agree that those five characteristics make sense, then I do think it's th things that people can work on and that there will be a payoff. Mm -hmm. And how have these um, how have these interviews affected your own leadership? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think I am always reminded by the CEOs um, of the importance of simply spending time with my employees. I manage a, a group of nine reporters, uh, and I try and spend a lot of time listening to them. Um, I try and spend a lot of time in actual conversation and not on email. I've been reminded often of the importance of talking to somebody over the phone or in person is very different than an email because there's so much opportunity for communication to be misread, to be lost in translation over email. Um, so you know, a lot of it comes down to time. I've really come to believe um, over time that pretty much about 90% of all problems can be solved actually talking <laughs> rather than letting stuff fester or trying to hash something out over email. I think picking up the phone, talking to somebody in person, and if you can have kind of adult conversations about something, it's amazing how much energy you can release and sort of avoid things that can really bog things down. Um, so those are kind of the main things that I've, I've really been reminded of by the CEOs. And I learn a tremendous amount from them, I have to say. That's great. Um, as a final question, uh, Knowledge of Wharton has um, a high school edition of the Business Journal. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious, I think the readers of uh, Knowledge of Wharton High School would be interested to know what advice you would give to young people who are passionate, ambitious, and who want to prepare for those future opportunities. I think the, the best advice I could give them would be to uh, reach out to people. And if they want to, um, you know, find mentors or there's somebody they've, uh, they're interested in, people respond when you reach out to them. If you have the right attitude and approach somebody and say, I'd really like to better understand what it is you do and learn from you, I think most of the time people respond. But I think especially in this age of technology where people text, they don't talk anymore that people get a little intimidated by that. But I've just found over my career, um, and I've had it when people do to me, if somebody reaches out to me, I've never met them before and said, followed your work, I'm gonna be in New York, I'm an aspiring journalist, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Sure, why not? I like a free cup of coffee. Uh, so that's my best advice. It was summarized by a CEO I met who said his best advice was what he called play in traffic. 
And it's not like parenting advice for little kids. It's life advice. Go do things. Go meet people. Because that's where so much of life, I think, is based on serendipitous meetings, chance meetings. You know somebody, you develop a relationship. They know somebody. They hear about a job. They think of you. I think so many people when they're young, I believe, see their careers as career ladders. It's kind of a straight path and you move up. Um, and that probably happens in some cases. Maybe somebody wants to be an ophthalmologist and they go through all the steps to be an ophthalmologist and they have their own practice. And a certain percentage of the population has careers like that. I think a very big portion of the population has a completely unpredictable career path and it's sort of all over the map. And so many of those kind of inflection points are based on relationships. Um, you get in you know, a particular job, you meet somebody, you work well with them, they leave, and then they recruit you to their new company. I really think that's how the way the world works a lot more than people really understand when they're young and really trying to plan their career. Well, thank you very much for that great advice, and great. thanks also for speaking with Knowledge of Wharton. Great. Thank you, Shannon.